Well, thank you very much. Um, my name is Danilo. Um, I work in BHP and um, in the platform engineering area, and my colleague, Arim Bogosi, yeah. also uh, on the platform engineering. So we're going to talk about this, uh, and we're going to move forward very quickly, as, as, as quickly as we can. All right. Okay, so the first question that we ask ourselves is, why? Why we're doing this? And why do we need a self-serving um, container as a service platform? But then when we go to a company or an enterprise and we see these numbers around the develop that talks about the developer experience, specifically, you know, doing cloud builds, totally made up numbers. So uh, definitely probably you won't see yourself reflected on that. And then if I need to migrate something, it takes me more than 80 days. And also, um, apart from that, then transitioning to ops, which means the infrastructure side, not only the application side, then you start to wonder, how bad is that for the complexity? And then how does that impact the acceleration of software, right? Software delivery. And then on top of that, you need to add also not only the frustrations for the developers, but also the kind of skills that those developers need to bring, they need to bring to the, to the table, and then how do you struggle as a company to find those skills in the market? Then the, thing, the thinking is, well, um, how does that impact the productivity of the company and uh, the software delivery on digital and data teams that need to use this, inf this type of infra infrastructure? So well, when we saw these things, then we tried to figure out from the developer experience and the developer point of view on, well, what do they need? And we, we try to address this on, on this way, right? So we try to say, well, day, day zero, what does an, um, a developer, a software developer need, needs to know about its platform? How they need to deploy that platform? What's the architecture of that platform? And to be fair, yes, we do have today fully, Kubernetes, fully managed Kubernetes services from the cloud providers, and they go from EKS to AKS, but also Fargate and some of the other ones. But even for those, the current state is, well, I need to deploy these things even using blueprints, but then I need to understand what the architecture looks like, right? I need to have that complexity in my mind. And then after I do that, then I need to go and say, well, I need to up up deploy my application. And that's day one. Can I deploy my application and then test it right away? But it's not only just having infrastructure. Also, I need to have, an any, as any big company, you have different network teams, different security teams that will need to check things for you. You need to do service requests to get that ingress going on so you can start testing, right? And once you get it up and running, guess what? Someone needs to manage it. If you don't, and probably you will have the budget, but do you have the skills to manage that as well? And everything adds on top. And once you get there, then you start thinking, well, now that I'm running, how do I scale? If I need to scale, how do I scale, extend this? And we'll talk about uh, a little bit later on wh where do we want to extend these things. But also, how do I do it cost effectively? By keeping my security posture at bay. And that's where my colleague Irene is going to talk about. Thank you, Janelo. Yes. So. Um, as uh, Danilo has been um, talking about, um, you know, the complexity of um, how do we um, manage, especially the containerization in um, enterprise. So we find that um, in an enterprise organization, obviously, you need to have a fully um, approved architecture for you to be able to deploy your application, especially in Kubernetes, you know, because you need to consider security. So. What we've done is like, okay, so then how do we simplify um, an app development? So on a day one as an, uh, app, an app developer, what do I need to do? So that's why we look into um, a persona from the application developer that on a day one for me, as a developer, I, I want my application, I do not want to be thinking about an infrastructure complexity because within an enterprise, it's not only about infrastructure, it's about the network as well. 
and then it's about how do you comply with that infrastructure, with the security and everything. So application and infrastructure deployment. So then you look into, okay, how can we, we simplify this? We came up with a, a centralized managed platform where we'll have a, we're sharing um, a, a cluster for, for our tenants. We simplified um, the way we onboard the customer. So on a day one, a customer will say that, okay, I would like to host my application on your platform. So they will request a Kubernetes namespace. So that will enable them um, the autonomy and the flexibility and speed. Because on a day one, everything is already um, prepared for them. The infrastructure is bended, everything is there. And also, not only for the infrastructure, you've already um, created a predefined um, the CICD pipeline with baked in um, security. And they are not supposed to be able to thinking about, okay, how am I going to uh, look into um, scanning my images? So you will have another persona in there, which is your platform engineer, uh, engineers or platform ops. Those are the, the, uh, the team that will help you to be able to look at, at the infrastructure and then do the monitoring and then be able to um, look into the resource allocation. So, and this is the journey of how the whole um, onboarding a customer in a shared platform look like. So for faster deployment, on a day one deployment, we say, okay, you request Kubernetes namespace through a self-serve portal, which we did in-house. So obviously you use the already uh, orchestrated um, Kubernetes that is there, but just request a namespace. So with the endorsed architecture, so we've done the whole architecture and then make sure that it conforms with the company um, policies. And then obviously also integrated with the tools that we need for your, um, your landscape to work. So where you've got a, your ingresses and your certificate, a lot of um, developers don't want to deal with those things. So the customer then will be able to deploy a containerized app. So whereby, okay, you already have set up with the tools that you need, especially even if you want to debug your tools, you know that, okay, I've got open telemetry already vended with my namespace. And then you can deploy your, your application. So in, in this one where we say with Edge is where now we will be able to scale into other different platform. And then on the day two, obviously, we'll be able to manage the application. Um, so we have got a, um, the monitoring uh, um, tools that we probably use, let's say in, in the market, a lot of people use New Relic or Datadoc. In this case, we use New Relic. So under the hood, how did we make the whole um, platform to work, to put it in together into perspective? Obviously, you'll have your user interface. So the self-serve management where we've kind of configured with the CICD pipeline, you've got your GitOps to deploy, which we did not have in, in the first place where everyone had their own dedicated clusters. So when you bring everything as a centralized, it means you've got a number of tools that people can share. And then um, you've got your application plane, your, where you've got your environment. So if you can look there, when you, you create a namespace, you need to have where you're going to store your keys, you've got your, your key vault, You've got your manager identity that you need, your container registry, GitLab runner, application uh, domain certificates. And then the infrastructure as a platform, we've got all the supporting um, uh, platform foundational that we need for the environment to work. How it all connects together when we look in, into under the hood. So you've got your developer there, so who requests those services. So your CI, where we'll have to use the GitLab in this space. Remember, I talked about the predefined um, CI-CD pipeline, and then you've got your CD, where you can use your Flux, or you can use your Argo CD. So, and then you've got your um, environment as a service through the UI or API, the portal that we've created, where you will request your namespace. And then I will set up, uh, or the team will set up the, uh, the namespace for you, and then you'll be able to get your namespace to create your application. So under that, you've got your platform foundational building blocks. So, and then you've got your security automation and guardrails. Because 
within the, um, the shared cluster, you need to have your isolations, you need to have your security, you, you need to make sure that you do not have um, a noisy neighbor. And in that case, um, when you've got your, your namespace in Kubernetes, we've connected it to a key vault, to your registry, to your managed identity, and then you can be able to get your logs and then you can be able to debug your application. So this becomes easier for a developer on a day one that, okay, give me Kubernetes namespace and then I'll create my application. So I'll give to my fellow colleague to continue and finish off. Thank you. So, and that's part of um, the idea, right? And the idea is also, I'm gonna go back a little bit on this one, let's see. The idea here is as well, extending all of this and all these optionalities to deploy here through an API. Very similar to what we find with the, with the cloud uh, uh, providers. So the idea is that you expose these optionalities to an API that then the developer can have full control on how to deploy their environment and where do they, do they, how they can extend. And that's part of the next, the next recommendation, right? And this is where we are trailing towards. Then definitely one of the recommendations is that you want to get your developers to actually use this platform as much as you can. And that means lowering the friction of entry as, as slow as you can. So, and lowering the friction is not only exposing this via an API, but also from the business point of view, making sure that they can, for example, enter and deploy their application at very low cost so they can test right away. So after they can test and rest assured that they, okay, now we can use this, then they will be able to go and say, okay, now we're going to go non-prod or prod. And once they go into the journey, then they will have the options on extending this to different locations now with the edge, um, the cloud edge um, options that we have today, which are very mature. Now you can actually use the Kubernetes underlying APIs and mechanisms and orchestration to actually extend this to the developers so that they can select the specific locations and a specific ingresses, whether it's a global or a very location specific for latency requirements. Um, also, for prod environment, make it sustainable. And uh, there are different options. You can use um, location parameters, but also offer different compute options but also use the infinity and infinity to orchestrate. But then one thing that we actually some, sometimes we miss is the use of centralized storage services. And what that, by that I mean is that you, every application needs a database on a storage. If they need to actually maintain that as well, that will affect the, uh, the gravity towards this platform. The idea is that you work with your storage services team and the database team to actually help them offer something similar at the storage level. And that has worked very well for us. Um, and now the developers have uh, access to a service catalog where they can have different options on compute, storage, and of course, networks as well. And that's the end of the story today. Well, thank you very much for all of you. And thank you for the Cloud Native Foundation for having us. Thank you. <laughs>